event. Food truly is the universal medium that all humans, regardless of our background, can meet and forge lasting relationships. And that is why a big part of what we do at Global Ties Arizona has always been home hospitality, where our local community members welcome our incoming international visitor groups into their homes to get to know one another over a meal. And food is, in, is an ambassador in and of itself. Historically, food has been used for peace building, even though it really has uh, only more recently become popular as well in public diplomacy. And this is because food is a tangible way to access culture. And similar to the International Visitor Leadership Program that we implement, the US Department of State has also facilitated many culinary diplomacy exchanges, sending US chefs abroad and receiving chefs from all around the world to the US. Uh, these exchanges are valuable because they make relationships between nations accessible through the simplicity of food. By sharing a meal together, individuals from different backgrounds are able to build mutual understanding and forge lasting peace. And undoubtedly, foods from all over the world are present in American households and restaurants across the country, thanks to our very own ethnic diversity here at home. And this evening, again, we are so fortunate that we get to experience Mexican heritage, culture and food with our partners at the consulate, the Ministry of Tourism of Oaxaca and Las Quince Salsas. So tonight we invite you to join in the celebration of Mexico's Day of Independence, which was officially yesterday, September 16th, and Hispanic Heritage Month, which kicked off on Wednesday of this week. Currently 60 million people in the United States identify as Hispanic or Latino, and this represents about 18% of our population. In turn, more than 36 million are of Mexican origin, which makes up 63% of the total number of individuals from Spanish speaking countries here in the US. Latino and specifically Mexican influences are felt in our communities all across the country, all across our state and our city of Phoenix and have contributed significantly to shaping what is present day US culture, festivities, sports and music. And so to kick off our program this evening, I am delighted to introduce again, um, the Honorable Jorge Mendoza Yescas, Consul General of the Consulate of Mexico here in Phoenix, who has been serving in this post as a member of the Mexican Foreign Service since March of 2019. Consul Mendoza has served in other capacities for the Mexican service in Vancouver, British Columbia, Presidio, Texas, and just south of us in Tucson. So Consul Mendoza, it is always such a pleasure uh, to work with you and your amazing team at the consulate. We've really enjoyed uh, putting this event together this, uh, this evening with you all. And de nuevo, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Le paso la palabra. Muchas gracias a todos. Buenas tardes, noches. Good evening, everyone. So I'm very honored to be virtually here tonight with, with all of you to celebrate the 211th anniversary of Mexico's independence and the start of the, of the Hispanic Heritage Month through the first edition of this um, Dining for Diplomacy featuring Oaxaca, Mexico. And I would like to thank, uh, of course, to Global Ties Arizona, Christine Allen and, and the entire team. You have done a, a tremendous job. Uh, also, I want to thank the Oaxaca restaurant Las Quince Salsas, uh, they prepared uh, different types of mold and enchiladas, uh, which will awaken our senses. Uh, thank you, Elisa Elizabeth Hernandez and Ricardo Santiago. Thank you to Gabriel Sanchez. Uh, he's a certified guide from the Ministry of Tourism in Oaxaca. Thank you, Gabriel, for being here and for the learned knowledge that you're going to share with us regarding that beautiful state of Mexico. Uh, Oaxaca State is uh, located, as we know, in the southwestern region of the country and, and it's indeed very famous for the beauty of its traditions, culture, nature, architecture, and, and as well as, as its unique cuisine. Um, the, uh, the historical and colonial downtown of Oaxaca de Juarez, uh, the capital city of, of the state of Oaxaca, is classified by UNESCO uh, as a world heritage site. Uh, moreover, Oaxacan gastronomy is a, a must and is internationally renowned for its delicious flavors like the mole negro, the quesillo, the tlayudas oaxaqueñas, and for sure, the traditional mezcal. I would like also 
to give a few remarks regarding the Mexican Independence Day and why, why it's important to celebrate it each year. It's commonly confused with the Cinco de Mayo in the US. Cinco de Mayo is another very important uh, date, but Independence, the Mexican Independence Day, Day on September 16, it's in, in when we celebrate uh, the, um, the call uh, by Father Hidalgo for independence from Spain, independence for Mexico, uh, of Mexico from Spain. That, uh, that happened on September 16, 1810. In Mexican uh, Independence Day, as, uh, as I said, um, uh, we celebrate when Father Hidalgo made the first cry, we call it El Grito for independence. So he demanded the end of Spanish rule in, in Mexico at the time was called New Spain. And well, this started the Mexican War of Independence, which uh, lasted over, over a decade. And on August 24th, 1821, Spain withdrew and officially recognized Mexico as an independent country. And Mexican Independence Day uh, has uh, developed into a very huge national celebration over the past uh, 211 years. And it's time for us to enjoy a wonderful evening. And thank you everyone for joining us online tonight. Buen provecho. Y viva México. Viva México. I was uh, I was so happy to be able to hear the the famous uh, El Grito, and I wonder, uh, Consul, if you could share just a real real quickly a little bit of, of background about El Grito, which is um, so widely and famously known. I I won't make you do it here. But... Okay. I don't, oh, yes. I don't. Uh, so, sorry, I, I was having some problems with, with my no, audio. No problem. Yes, yes, we, what we do, it's uh, an arenga, we call it in Spanish. Uh, we uh, celebrate it, uh, not just in Mexico, uh, and it's a civic official act performed not only by the president of Mexico, but for every governor uh, in Mexico, we have 32 states, we have 32 governors but also we have more than 2000 municipalities. So all of them at the same time almost do this Arenga Viva Mexico. And it's, it's what uh, Padre Hidalgo said uh, uh, at that time. He uh, called the people to uh, take the arms and, and, and go to, uh, to war and then gain independence from, from Spain. But not, not only in Mexico, uh, we do that act, official act, uh, also in all the almost 200 Mexican uh, representations all over the world, uh, I, I'm including embassies and consulates, uh, do the same. Uh, two days ago, I had um, I was so lucky to do that in Phoenix in the, in the film theater. That was uh, our official act on September 15. But yesterday, actually, we had another uh, official act, Arenga, uh, with our friends of the diplomatic corps and, and many, many friends of Mexico. And since the, that act, that arenga, it's expressed in a very energetic way, uh, it makes um, people to get very emotional and feel uh, nostalgic about Mexico. So that's why it's very famous, in my opinion. It's it's definitely very powerful, and I hope that someday I have the opportunity to experience that in Mexico because I, I've only been able to see the kind of reenactment here in in Phoenix um, for quite a quite a few years. But I can can imagine that it must be a very very powerful thing to experience in in Mexico. And thank you so much for sharing that with us because I think you're you know you're absolutely right that. It is commonly mistaken in, in the United States that we think that Cinco de Mayo is, is specifically for the Mexican independence. So it is, I think, so important for us to bring Mexican Independence Day to, uh, to light here in our communities so that we can continue to educate ourselves about, um, about history and about culture right across the border from us. And so with that said, um, I would I would like to share uh, first before we continue with our speakers um, this evening is we're going to just get a quick little um, highlight about five minutes of the scenes of Oaxaca to really set the stage for the rest of this evening's program. 
So if you'll just give me a moment here to get us screen sharing, that'll be coming up on your screen in just a moment. Great. Well, I hope I hope that you all enjoyed that video. I absolutely I, I love the the music that accompanies that video. All those amazing scenes, beautiful scenery. Uh, yes, like Sonal said, vibrant culture, such beautiful colors. Um, as we're kind of shifting here, we're going to head over to the restaurante um, in just a moment to speak with Ricardo and Elizabeth at Las Quinte Salsas. But I, I wonder, um, as we watch that, that video, what um, maybe agricultural products or things you saw that obviously are things that um, attribute uh, to the amazing cuisine that uh, we're enjoying even this evening. Um, and what you can be, uh, what you, what you can find when you go there in person. So any, you can throw that in the chat. Maybe like some some things that you might have seen ingredient wise um, of of local agricultural.
products. Don't be shy. Coffee, coffee beans for sure. Anything else? I know I saw some, I, I mean, I, I thought the first thing going in there would be tortillas, right? Because everybody thinks of tortillas and absolutely we, we saw the, the maize, the, the corn. Um, I, 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 I maybe, maybe Gabriel knows this, of how many types of maize there actually is um, that produce so many different types of tortillas. I, until I went to Mexico uh, about a year ago, I didn't even realize that there were so many different types of tortillas. Um, and it's just, uh, it, the tortilla itself has this amazing legacy. So very, very incredible. But that said, let's head over to the restaurants uh, to uh, Las Quince Salsas, where Ricardo Santiago is, is waiting for us to share a little bit more about the meal that some of you are enjoying this evening. Um, Ricardo and his uh, mother, correct me if I'm wrong, Ricardo, but Elizabeth Her Hernandez um, are the owners um, of Las Quince Salsas, located at 722 West Hatcher Road in North Phoenix. So those of you that went to pick up your meals this evening, you will have seen their fun restaurant. And uh, Ricardo is joining us right now from the Mezcalería. <laughs> Maybe you can tell us first what La Mezcalería is. Hi, uh, yes. Hi, Kristen. Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to share our food and our culture with them. Um, with the, our community here in Phoenix and uh, in, in Arizona as well. Uh, so yeah, the Mezcalería is a, a concept that is uh, picking up uh, real quick, uh, quickly um, in recent years. Um, so uh, for for those who don't know, uh, me, uh, uh, mezcal is a type of um, it's uh, similar to tequila, but it's not. Um, it's more uh, the 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 process of of making it is more traditional. Uh, it doesn't involve any industrial capacity, so it's it's handmade by um, people in in um, in Oaxaca. They uh, they wake up every morning, go uh, plow the fields, uh, harvest the agave, uh, and then they they do all by hand. It's a very uh, long um, and <laughs> I, I, I would say um, very. Uh, intricate uh, process uh, to deliver uh, everyone uh, just a little bottle of, <laughs> of tequila. So it's, uh, it has a unique uh, taste, uh, unlike um, tequila, it's, uh, it's, it has a smoky taste um, and it's, it's, it's very unique. Um, I, if you haven't tried it, I, uh, I invite you all to uh, uh, give, it a, give it a chance uh, one day. It's, it's a really, um, especially, uh, well, I, you can drink it uh, by itself or you can make a, a cocktail, a margarita as well. It, uh, it works either way. <laughs> uh, so yeah. I, um, I, I was just going to say, Ricardo, that I was fortunate enough to have someone at Las Quince Salsas this afternoon prepare a mezcal margarita for me oh. as I was waiting to pick up my food. And so I have to say that, it, yes, folks, if you have not had a margarita with mezcal instead of tequila, you don't know what you're missing. So <laughs> try it with mezcal. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, like you mentioned uh, earlier, um, uh, food is, uh, it's all, uh, acts like an ambassador of, uh, uh, for our cultures uh, here in um, we, when we moved to Phoenix, um, one of the things that uh, helped us uh, uh, share uh, our culture with uh, the community is our food. Uh, so that's how we uh, got started with the restaurant um, uh, nine years ago. Uh, we started in a, small, a smaller place than this, than uh, where we are right now, uh, but uh, with uh, really uh, high hopes that uh, uh, people here in Arizona will enjoy uh, our Oaxacan food, and they, uh, and we could uh, share um, share it with um, our community here. Uh, so, like, uh, like, like Mexican cuisine, uh, uh, Oaxacan food it's uh, it's based on the uh, staple items uh, of uh, corn, uh, beans, and uh, also uh, chili peppers. But uh, the unique thing about Oaxacan food is it, it's very um, distinguished by uh, geographic um, areas in the state. Also, 
it is it, it is influenced by the indigenous culture of Oaxaca, which is a big, big, big part in Oaxaca. Um, so uh, right now, uh, let me share what we have, what uh, our, our menu for tonight. So first of all, we have the uh, the empanadas. Uh, hopefully you can see that. <laughs> so we have uh, three uh, empanadas. One. Uh, so empanadas are. Um, uh, normally in other places you will say uh, here empanadas are baked. Uh, we uh, our uh, empanadas in Oaxaca are kind of our version of uh, quesadillas, <laughs> well, made with uh, corn uh, uh, tortilla uh, by hand uh, and uh, stuffed with uh, different ingredients uh, and uh, quesillo, uh, mostly known as uh, Oaxacan cheese. Uh, so the first one is uh, we have one. Uh, empanada with uh, mushroom and uh, uh, quesillo, uh, one with epazote, which is a, a, a herb a very characteristic of uh, a Oaxacan cuisine. Uh, and also the, we have the flor de calabaza, which is the uh, um, pumpkin blossom. So it's like a, the, the blossom that uh, comes out of a, a, a pumpkin. That's, uh, that's what it is. And it's delicious for all of those who are uh, enjoy uh, vegetarian or uh, even vegan food, uh, I think they will, they will really like this one, uh, except for the quesillo, of course. <laughs> uh, so next we have move on to the moles. Uh, so uh, for tonight, we have three different types of mole. Uh, we have uh, the black mole. Uh, and then we have this, uh, it's, this one is called estofado. Uh, and finally, we have the green mole. So uh, uh, the mostly mostly uh, known uh, mole here in the United States are probably uh, black mole, but uh, we have these uh, two types of moles, which are mostly um, made during uh, during parties in, in Oaxaca. So uh, when whenever there's a uh, there's a wedding or there's a birthday, uh, they usually uh, will. Uh, make uh, uh, green and uh, estof uh, green mole and estofado um, as a special occasion. Uh, also, well, of course, the uh, black mole is also one of the staples of uh, Mexican uh, Oaxacan cuisine. Uh, and finally, uh, we have. I I, can, I want to show you. I don't think this is included in your dinner, but uh, this is what uh, 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 Jorge um, mentioned that La Yuda. So it's it's kind of a uh, it's a big big uh, tlayudas are big corn tortillas made by hand and uh, so we uh, uh, smear them with uh, uh, lard uh, well it, it's called asiento it's it's kind of a um, uh, a pork uh, reduction lard uh, uh, black beans uh, Oaxacan cheese and um, and you can also add uh, other vegetables such as um, such as pork or, or beef. Uh, and finally, uh, let me show you here. I have uh, another uh, very unique um, item of uh, Oaxacan cuisine. These are uh, chapulines or other um, or uh, grasshoppers. <laughs> so if you haven't tried this, you should give it a chance. They look scary, but uh, they're not. They're delicious. <laughs> Um, I have I have tried the chapulines before, and they they I mean yes you're right they look scary to us because we're not used to to yes. eating that type of food but uh, absolutely I think it's something to try and they are very good. Yeah, they they um, I mean I I grew up eating the, eating them, uh, so for me it's like super normal to eat chapulines, uh, but yeah for someone who. Uh, has never seen them, they might think, oh, uh, well, it looks a little uh, <laughs> scary. And, uh, but they're um, really good, uh, very good source of protein. <laughs> and they, they do have a crazy amount of protein. I think, um, uh, I, I can't remember how many like grasshoppers, but essentially they have uh, a, a very little amount of grasshoppers has more protein than a hamburger. Yes. <laughs> yes, they, they, yeah, they're very uh, rich in protein. Um, oh. Uh, so yeah, and then they are a very uh, common snack in Oaxaca. <laughs> uh, so that's it. Uh, well, I, I think also you you took home uh, uh, a glass of uh, horchata or Oaxacan horchata. It's uh, yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> 
So it's a house made um, uh, and it doesn't, it, it's, it, it could be, it, it's a vegan uh, orchata. It doesn't include any dairy in it. Uh, so if anyone in our audience is vegan, uh, cheers. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, that's it. Uh, well, th uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, allowing us to bring our um, uh, food from our uh, home uh, state uh, to your homes. And I hope you, uh, you and your families enjoy it. And uh, I hope to see you here soon. Oh, al, con al contrario, thank you so much to you, uh, Ricardo, to Elizabeth um, for, for being here with us, for organizing this event with us and for sharing your culture um, with us. I think that this has been um, an amazing way for us to get to know uh, Oaxaca much better, even just being here in Phoenix. And I think that's what's so great is that we have the, the capability to to really experience it without having to travel anywhere. So again, yes. <laughs> I also, um, I, I had asked in the chat and I wonder, um, because there are some people from home that weren't able to join us for the meal portion, but I know they're probably taking some notes on what they should try when they travel to Oaxaca or when they just travel to, or just go over to your restaurant, what they're going to order when yes. they come in to visit you. But I did make a question in the uh, chat and I don't think anyone's answered it. Which one of the moles is the spice, like the spiciest? I know which one I thought was the spiciest when I tried it. Oh yeah, uh, so the spiciest mole is the red mole. Uh, uh, it's not in the, the ones we have, right? That we made for uh, tonight. Uh, we, um, none of these are uh, actually spicy uh, from, like that are gonna just make you uh, drink lots of lots of water. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the spices mole is the uh, red mole. That one is uh, made with uh, a different type of uh, chili peppers with uh, really combined uh, well with uh, other spices and uh, makes it the, yeah, that makes it the spiciest one. Uh, yeah, for those who don't like spicy food, um, I think um, black mole is uh, the uh, safe choice. <laughs> But there are definitely options for those of us. I, I, I say those of us because I always try so hard to try the spicy foods. And then <laughs> I realize that it's really not something that I can do. So yes. there are safe options for us that can't stand the heat, right? <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yeah. And uh, we also have uh, uh, here, uh, I forgot to mention this actually. Uh, so these are the uh, enchiladas. So here uh, you have. Uh, these are all, um, so here is the uh, uh, a black mole. Uh, this is the entomatada, which is a, a, tomato, a tomato sauce. And this is the enfrijolada, which is a black bean sauce. So uh, yeah, if you, um, those are also uh, very common in, uh, these are more like uh, in Oaxaca, people eat them as, as lunch. <laughs> yes. So uh, yeah, the, the enchiladas with uh, the tomato sauce or the, uh, uh, black bean sauce, they are, uh, mo uh, people eat them for uh, lunch mostly, but uh, here you can have them all day. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. And Thank I don't you. know if you can see the chat, but there are quite a few people, those that are saying, uh, Liz says the food looks delicious and she wishes she was there to enjoy tasting it. Um, hopefully, Liz, when you, you make it to uh, Phoenix, you can you can stop into Las Quinte Salsas to to order this meal. Um, and yes, the presentation she also mentioned is marvelous, and it, it she's exactly right. It looks beautiful. So, thank yes. you so very much for being thank here you. to present our meal um, to us and for sharing this with us tonight. So. Uh, we're going to, thank you, Ricardo. We're going to move on um, to our next guest, our last speaker, but certainly not, uh, certainly not least, um, Gabriel Sanchez. Hello, Gabriel. It is so good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much. I want to um, introduce you uh, to our, our audience, our um, dinner guests this evening. Um, Gabriel Sanchez Gutierrez is a certified guide in Oaxaca on, and he is here to, this evening on behalf of the Ministry of Tourism of Oaxaca. Uh, Gabriel was born in Coahuila. Co I know I'm going to, to butcher that. You're going to have to say it correctly for me. Gabriel, I'm having a hard time with the pronunciation. 
but he moved to Oaxaca when he was uh, just, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I won't try it again. Um, but with he moved to uh, Oaxaca with his parents when he was just nine months old. So he considers himself a full Oaxacan. Um, he studied foreign languages and art history at the University of Oaxaca and speaks English, French, Italian, and Spanish, as well as some German and Russian. And uh, Gabriel is married to a native Oaxacan woman and has worked as a tour guide since 1984. And he is very passionate about his country's history and specializes in viceroyal arts and iconography, which I find really, really fascinating. Um, so, Gabriel, eh, un placer eh, tenerle aquí con nosotros. It's so nice to have you. Thank you so much for joining us from Oaxaca uh, this evening. And we are so uh, thrilled to be able to learn more about Oaxaca and all that we need to see in Oaxaca when we might be able to travel there in person someday. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to let you know where Oaxaca is located. Oaxaca is located in Southern Mexico. Uh, it borders with uh, uh, Guerrero State towards the east. Uh, Puebla towards the north, uh, Veracruz towards the northeast, and then uh, towards uh, the southeast uh, or east, Chiapas, okay? So uh, Oaxaca is the fifth uh, largest state of uh, Mexico after Chihuahua, Coahuila, Sonora, and Durango. Uh, I will let you know uh, briefly uh, how Oaxaca, uh, how the name originated and how uh, the population started in the Valley of Oaxaca. Uh, it all happened in uh, 1486 uh, when uh, Emperor Huizotl from the Aztecs uh, had the idea of settling a cocoa bean route. Uh, he had to come by Oaxaca and uh, uh, he subdued with his uh, warriors, the Zapotec people who lived already in uh, the valley. And um, uh, afterwards, uh, he and his people had to cut down a lot of uh, uh, trees that we know as Wajes in order to build a fortress. They named their fortress Wakjakak. It's a Nahuatl Aztec uh, name that means Yacatl, nose or peak, and Huaxin, the Huaje tree. So at the peak or at the nose of the Huaje tree is the uh, literal translation of Huaxacac, at the peak or at the nose of the Huaje tree. Later on, uh, the word was Hispanicized to uh, Oaxaca because the Spaniards could not pronounce it. So, uh, uh, the Zapotec uh, king, uh, Cosijoesa, had his capital in Sachila, and of course he didn't like the presence of Aztecs in the valley, and uh, he had to talk to Tzawindanda, the uh, Mishte king, uh, so they could join their forces, and uh, they attacked and defeated the Aztecs in a fortress in the isthmus of Tehuantepec known as Giengola. And afterwards, uh, the uh, Zapotec, uh, I mean, the Aztec, sorry, the Aztec king had to offer uh, his daughter in matrimony to Cosijoesa, the uh, Zapotec king. No, they had, uh, well, Cosijoesa and, and, and his wife, Coyolicalsin, had four children. Uh, Awisotl was intelligent because he, he wanted to, to, to pass without any problem to the valley of uh, Oaxaca and being the, the father-in-law of the uh, uh, Zapotec king, so he has the free pass to, to the valley of Oaxaca. He was intelligent. Uh, I tell you this briefly because uh, by the time the Spanish conquistadors arrived to the valley of Oaxaca, there was already a population of Mixtecs, Zapotecs, and Aztecs in the valley. The Spaniards entered Oaxaca the 25th of November of 1521. 
it's an important day, day and date. I let you know why. Uh, Francisco de Orozco was the captain who led the Spanish soldiers, Tlaxcaltecas and Aztecs. Uh, and um, close to the Atoyac River, uh, um, a priest, a mercenary priest, uh, who accompanied the conquistador Orozco, uh, ordered the Tlaxcaltecas to, to settle uh, an altar because he wanted to say the first mass. Uh, it was an important date, 25th of November, the, the day of St. Catherine of Alexandria. Uh, of course, that uh, the conquest wasn't bloody because the people here knew that the most powerful warriors, the most powerful people, uh, the Aztecs were conquered already. You know, they were defeated. And so uh, uh, that's how this uh, started. Uh, the first church of Oaxaca was dedicated to St. Catherine of Alexandria. Yeah, uh, the fiesta is the 25th of, of uh, November. And, uh, and it's a key date. It's a key date because I'll, I'll, I'll explain Morelos, Jose Maria Morelos y Pavón, uh, this uh, uh, great hero of uh, our War of Independence, took militarily Oaxaca the 25th of November of 1812. Oh, he was an intelligent man. He, he knew that uh, the Spaniards were going to be busy celebrating. So he surprised the uh, uh, Spaniards and took uh, militarily Oaxaca in a couple of hours. No? So uh, that is how Oaxaca started. I go back to, to uh, uh, the times of Orozco, the uh, arrival of the Spaniards in 1521. Uh, the city of Oaxaca was designed by the same person who designed uh, Mexico City and Veracruz. His name was Alonso Garcia Bravo. And the royal ordinances uh, said that uh, the cities had to be designed like chessboards. So they had to obey that, those ordinances. And that is the case of, of Oaxaca. Every street uh, measures uh, 90 varas castellanas, which is approximately 100 meters. Uh, it looks like a chessboard from the plane. No? Uh, so, uh, 80 families of Spaniards uh, came to, to the valley. Uh, once uh, the plots were distributed, once uh, this person said, uh, well, uh, these are going to be the plus to build the government building, and those were going to be the plus to build a cathedral. No? And 80 Spanish families arrived, uh, and that's how a uh, colonial life started. Uh, the Spaniards saw that the indigenous people could manufacture a, a, a dye, a beautiful dye out of the cochineal bugs. So uh, uh, they didn't have it. They started to, to infest these uh, prickly percactile leaves where cochineal bugs live. And they started the business. They started to export uh, uh, tons and tons of these insects to Europe. No, uh, cochineal became the red gold of Oaxaca. No, uh, Oaxaca became an important uh, a city economically. When we walk along the streets in uh, the historical center, we noticed all these uh, beautiful uh, houses built with a green stone. It's a tufa stone uh, uh, that uh, gave uh, the nickname to the city, you know, the Green Antequera, the city of jade. So uh, it became an important uh, city in colonial times, but life wasn't easy for indigenous people. You know? And uh, then uh, the War of Independence uh, started in Dolores Hidalgo, Father Hidalgo, uh, took the banner of our, of our Lady of Guadalupe in the Church of Atotonilco. Uh, that's how our Lady of Guadalupe be became like the patroness of uh, the people who were uh, wanting their freedom and later uh, in general for all Mexicans. Um, 
Morelos uh, decided to come to, to Oaxaca the 25th of November of 1812. Remember, because he wanted to surprise the um, uh, Spaniards. Uh, but he, he was given, according to uh, um, Cayetano Esteba, one uh, famous historian, he was given previously a map of the city of Oaxaca. Uh, so Morelos knew which were the weak points he had to attack. No? And uh, uh, the convents then were used as uh, fortresses, uh, the convent of Santo Domingo, the convent of St. Francis of Assisi, the convent of Bethlehem, the convent of El Carmen, they were fortresses of, of the Spaniards, they were fortified there. Um, and um, also uh, the hill of the fort or Cerro del Fortín was an important uh, watchtower, was an important place, no? a strategic place also uh, where the royal uh, soldiers were uh, settling. So uh, uh, important heroes came to, to Oaxaca, Mariano Matamoros, he attacked uh, the coming of Santo Domingo. No, uh, Hermenegildo Galeana, no? uh, the brothers uh, Bravo. No? The brothers Bravo attacked uh, the convent of St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, Matamoros, Mariano Matamoros, uh, who later had his barracks in one uh, important community called Tlacolula de Matamoros. No? Uh, he came to Oaxaca as well. He was a priest as well, uh, like Morelos. Uh, uh, he took the most important uh, fortified uh, monastery, which was uh, El Carmen Alto. So uh, people wonder now why Santo Domingo wasn't uh, like uh, the most important point to attack. Uh, uh, if it, it, it was a huge monastery, but uh, for some reason, no, uh, 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 the most important uh, fortified point was uh, El Carmen uh, Monastery and Church. So uh, Matamoros took that uh, uh, place. And uh, as I said, um, the battle just uh, lasted for a couple of hours. And then uh, Morelos, uh, defeated the, the, the royal army. And this, uh, there's an important point in the history of Oaxaca that I want to add because uh, uh, Manuel Felix Fernandez, uh, this uh, general had to take the monastery of Bethlehem. No? But he was afraid because he saw a lot of soldiers there. But he heard that the bells of uh, Santo Domingo and El, and, and El Carmen Alto were ringing. And that was the sign that uh, his friends had taken already those points. So he was filled of courage and attacked the Bethlehem uh, monastery and defeated the, 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 the royal army there as well. So uh, this, I think, is, is, is quite important because uh, he those are those uh, were the famous words of this person. He swam took his sword, led his troops, and defeated the royal army. So after that uh, victory, uh, this man decided to change his name and uh, because he thought that uh, the Church of Guadalupe, which was next to the convent of Bethlehem, helped him. Uh, he thought that it was a favor accomplished by Our Lady of Guadalupe. So he changed his name to Guadalupe Victoria. Okay. 
Guadalupe because our lady of Guadalupe and Victoria because of his victory. No? And he was the very first president of Mexico. No? That was that happened after a, a, our short empire because we had an empire that lasted for a few months with Agustin de Iturbide. And we had a republic as a system and then we had uh, this uh, hero who became the president of uh, uh, Mexico, this hero of the war of independence. Another hero uh, uh, who was uh, unfortunately executed in Oaxaca, he was executed in Quilapan de Guerrero, uh, the 14th of February of 1831. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he was the second president of Mexico, Vicente Guerrero. Oh, and afterwards, uh, another person, uh, Bustamante, oh, Anastasio Bustamante became uh, the president. But I tell you all this because Spain did not recognize the independence of Mexico. He did not, they did not recognize the independence of Mexico until 1836. So a long time, uh, many years had to pass, and so uh, uh, Spain finally recognized the, the independence of, uh, of Mexico. And of course, we know that the 19th century in Mexico was chaotic. I mean, so later we had in 1847, the American invasion, and then later we had the uh, a war against France, no? And so uh, uh, the 19th century was chaotic in, in Mexico. And we had a revolution later, you know? And uh, so uh, uh, just after the revolution is when we have uh, years of, of peace, you know? But uh, uh, the War of Independence was like that, happened like that in, in, in Oaxaca. I just want to add something else because uh, Morelos, Jose Maria Morelos remained in the city of Oaxaca uh, between the 25th of November of 1812 to the 9th of February of 1813. There is a chair, a white beautiful chair in the uh, town hall. Nobody can sit in that chair. There's a portrait uh, on the back of the chair. Uh, 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 because that chair belonged to Jose Maria Morelos. Uh, Jose Maria Morelos y Pavón founded the large or the largest park in town that we know as El Llano de Guadalupe. Well, he named it El Llano de Guadalupe because the Church of Guadalupe is in one of the corners. Um, he planted a, a fresno, a, a, a tree that we still find it there, still alive. Uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the tree that planted Guadalupe Victoria, a wild fig tree, uh, collapsed just a few days ago. Uh, because during a storm with the wind, uh, the fig tree collapsed. I was so sad. Um, so uh, I want to add also that uh, Jose Maria Morelos, uh, he lived in the corner of Valerio Trujano uh, Street uh, uh, and, uh, and the main square, the Zocalo. He, it was a house uh, uh, that belonged to a person, Sarabia, I don't remember the, no, Gutierrez, uh, the last name, no. Uh, and uh, he lived there. He lived there and uh, uh, he went to thank to the lady of Guadalupe, to the Virgin of Guadalupe, to thank all the favors provided to the uh, uh, people who were fighting for the war, for the independence, no? Uh, he arrived the 25th of November. So the 12th of December is the day of the fiesta of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So he was in Oaxaca. He went to the shrine of uh, Guadalupe to thank her, the favors provided to him and his people. Um, and also he was here to go to uh, Our Lady of Soledad Basilica. Our Lady of Soledad is the patroness of all Oaxacans. So he was here, he went to say thanks as well to Our Lady of Soledad. 
and he gave her a small cannon uh, to announce the pilgrimages of the 18th of December. No? And uh, so he did uh, incredible things in Oaxaca in such a few days, no? between the 25th of November to the 9th of uh, February of 1813. He did a lot of important things in, in Oaxaca. So uh, that's uh, how things happened. I don't know what else uh, uh, to add, but uh, I... <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you so much. That honestly, I, I think that we we've learned so, so much. I see claps going on in the um, in the gallery. So I think that means that our, our audience as well has enjoyed learning about this. I think what also um, stuck with me and something that I think kind of leads into um, our, our next piece by showing the video of the Gelaguetza. And I wonder if you could actually give a little bit um, uh, prelude to that video um, would be um, absolutely the, you know, still that very strong presence of the indigenous cultures that is still celebrated today through the Gelaguetza, through other um, festivities. But really um, what, what just really struck me was the, the uh, how you were talking about the three in, indigenous tribes specifically um, in, in the beginning fighting for independence. So I don't know if you'd like sure. to share a little bit about the Gelaguetza before we go into our video. Oh, definitely. Uh, listen, uh, Gelaguetza is a word that means gift or a reciprocal contribution. No, that's the literally meaning of uh, Gelaguetza. And it's a festivity. It's a, uh, our maximum folkloric fiesta that happens in uh, Oaxaca, the two last Mondays of July, every year. No? Um, of course, uh, it's a festivity that was lost in time. Uh, uh, um, people did not celebrate it anymore. But when Oaxaca was celebrating its uh, 400th anniversary, in uh, 1932, Francisco Cortez, the governor, uh, rescued the festivity. You know? He called the indigenous people from the different regions to perform their dances on a place that we know as the Hill of the Fort. It's a place, uh, it's our watchtower, as I said, uh, you have beautiful views uh, to the city uh, of Oaxaca from there. And so we celebrated Gelaguetza again for the first time in 1932, uh, Andres Enestrosa, a very famous uh, uh, Oaxacan philosopher, historian, uh, wrote about it. He was there in that celebration, in that first Gelaguetza. And so uh, Oaxaca uh, uh, is uh, a mountainous state. No? Uh, one time uh, when Hernán Cortés uh, had an interview with uh, uh, the emperor, Charles I of Spain, uh, the emperor uh, asked him, can you tell me wa how Oaxaca looks like? And then the, the emperor uh, immediately took a sheet of paper, he crumpled the sheet of paper in his fist and then extended it back on the table and said, Oaxaca is just like that because of all the peaks, because of all the mountains. And it's, I think the main reason uh, Having a lot of mountains, uh, we have all these indigenous groups living isolated in their communities, and that is how they have preserved their traditions, their languages, their colorful clothing. So uh, Oaxaca is divided in eight geographic regions. The Northern Sierra, where Benito Juarez was born, our hero of the reform, you know, I didn't talk about it because it's a different uh, history uh, period, uh, the reform. Uh, he was born in the Northern Sierra, but uh, we have the Southern Sierra, we have the High Papaloapan or Tuxtepec, we have the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, we have the coast, we have the Cañada uh, region and the Central Valley region. So we have eight geographic regions. Uh, Oaxaca has 570 townships, but the townships have uh, municipal agencies, uh, police agencies, rancherias. So in total, we have something like 14,000, 12 to 14,000 uh, villages. Can you imagine that? 
25 different languages are spoken in the state of Oaxaca, and there are 17 different ethnic groups. Zapotecs, Mixtecs, Chochos, Guaves, Triques, Popolocas, Ixcatecos, Cuicatecos, Mazatecos, Chontales, Chatinos, Amusgos, Chinantecos, Mijes, Soques, Nahuas, and the Afro-Mestizos. 17 different ethnic groups, and imagine Imagine uh, when this uh, celebration takes place in that amphitheater for 12,500 people. And uh, when, <clears throat> when we have so many bands of music playing, and when these people, with, when these indigenous people are dancing, uh, performing their dances, uh, singing in their languages, and as the word says it, is a gift, see? Uh, once they finish dancing, they throw their gift, they bring along, which can consist of a handicraft or a fruit, pineapples, if it's a, a pineapple flower from two step back, no, they throw to the audience the pineapples, the fruits they bring along. And uh, it is really a fantastic uh, month to come to Oaxaca, July, no? So uh, uh, that's what I can uh, explain uh, uh, about Kelgetza, no? Uh, uh, it's really, uh, I think, uh, uh, the most beautiful of our celebrations, no? I mean, we have the Night of Radishes in, on December. We have uh, the Day of the Dead. Well, Day of the Dead is something special. Uh, I think it's unique. No, and, and people really are coming to see our celebration. I don't know, uh, I would like to have a longer time to explain all these traditions because uh, really, I mean, uh, Day of the Dead, I think it's, it's unique. But I mean, uh, Gelaguetza is wonderful. Uh, imagine all the people, 1,200, uh, 12,000, I mean, 500 people waving their hats when, uh, uh, people are singing the Mixtec song, La Cancion Mixteca, and all of them are waving, all the thousands of people, amazing. Uh, you have to come to see, to witness our Gelaguetza. Absolutely. I, I, I know that after, while also watching this video, that everyone is going to really want to be able to experience it in person. Yeah. So let's go ahead and I will go ahead and show the video. I think it's about five minutes. After that, we'll take a few questions uh, for Ricardo and uh, Gabriel. Also, if you have any questions for Consul Mendoza, he's with us as well. So let's go ahead and watch uh, the video of Gelaguetza um, and get those questions ready. So we'll wrap up around 7.15 on schedule.
Wow, there were there we saw the hats waving in the in the stadium. I bet that is such a powerful thing. Do you get to to be there almost every year? What does it look like right now for uh, for social gatherings? I'm Gabriel? sorry. Yes, it's well, sorry. That's okay. I was I was ask, I was asking if um, what what the gatherings are looking like right now. Um, maybe not so much Gelaguetza, maybe Gelaguetza or or other gatherings. Yes, yes. Thank you for the question. Um, actually, uh, we didn't have the the celebration, the Gelaguetza celebration uh, this year because of the pandemic. We didn't have it last year either because of the pandemic. So only three times in uh, once uh, uh, Governor Francisco uh, Cortez uh, rescued the celebration, only three times we haven't had the Gelaguetza. No? Uh, the first time because of the uh, teachers riot, 2006, and uh, last year uh, and, and, and this year. No? We hope, we really hope that, ne that next year we will have a again, the, the Gela Gela, the Gela Getza uh, celebrated uh, in Oaxaca. Um, I forgot to tell you that uh, uh, we see the dancers of uh, uh, the different regions of Oaxaca, uh, they are performing the, their dances along the streets of Oaxaca uh, because the government uh, calls them to um, perform. No, their dances uh, along the streets two days before the celebration. That happens normally on Saturday afternoon. And uh, a lot of people uh, gather to see them uh, dancing uh, along the streets uh, in, in, in Oaxaca. So it's a time of, of joy. You know? uh, uh, everybody is happy, some having a mezcalito there. You know? So uh, uh, it's really a, a, a time to celebrate. Well, it, it looks like an amazing celebration uh, to witness. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm so glad that we've been able to learn a little bit more about Oaxaca's history, role in independence today, and also it, it meet you, Gabriel, Ricardo. Thank you so much for, for joining us from, uh, from the restaurant. I see you're still there. Hello. <laughs> and I, I wanted to, I know that we're, okay, we only have a few minutes left. I'm sorry, I was just checking my time. Um, but I wanted to see if anyone else from the audience um, had any, any questions they wanted to ask um, any of our speakers this evening. Um, or uh, additionally, if Ricardo or Gabriel want to share anything additional that they didn't get to, please feel free as well. And feel free to come on the mic. We'd love to hear you. I see some folks have been active in the chat, but we'd love to we'd love to hear you. Uh, 